good afternoon. I, I shouldn't have to introduce myself, correct? You should all know that I'm Isabella Kirkman, right? I mean, I, I live in this big, grand house on the corner of Colville and Cherry, the brick house. You've seen it, haven't you? Surely you've seen this house. I've seen it. I should hope so. I mean, my, my family's been here for, golly, roughly 30 years now that it being 1903. We've been here for a long time. Well, okay, may, maybe if you don't know that I'm Isabella Kirkman, then surely you know my husband, William Kirkman, cattleman, farmer, city council member, is on the board of trustees of Whitman College and the board of the penitentiary and the local school board. Surely, William Kirkman, you know his name, you know his reputation, correct? One thing about William, you know, it, it hardly seems possible that it's now 10 years that I've been a widow. Yes, he died in 1893 on that train in Wisconsin. But we'll talk more about that later. The thing is about William, he, he's always gotten most of the attention around here, and I, I don't think that's quite right. I mean, I've had a pretty interesting life too, you know. And I think it's time that I talked about it. That's I. Isabella Kirkman. I know I'm always very elegantly dressed and, and I entertain all the most important people in my home, you know, the Ankenes and the Paines and the Penroses, the Bakers, the Quins. And you know, once I had 100 people for lunch. Of course, I had to sit them in shifts so I could accommodate everybody, but Everybody who was important was there that day. But despite my social position and my financial success and my wealth, you know, I really come from rather humble origins. If you asked anybody in Walla Walla today, they would say the same thing. We've worked hard. We've been through a lot. You know, I'll share my history with you if you'd like. You seem like very pleasant people, although you are wearing rather peculiar clothing. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you will not judge. My husband was British, but not I. No, no, I'm Irish. I'm Irish. And these are my parents, Agnes and Robert Potts. I was born in Bally Bay, Ireland in 1845. Some people have checked some records and say that it was really 1841, but um, th there's no use quibbling about a few years, do you think? No. The Potts family was Protestant. I need to make that very clear. Very clear. They were Protestant. They lived in very northern Ireland, but they were not Catholic. In fact, in Bally Bay, if I was walking down the footpath and I was about to encounter a Catholic person, I would cross the street to avoid that encounter. All the Protestants in Bally Bay felt the same way. Although I've noticed that here in Walla Walla, it doesn't seem to matter that much. But, but, but back to Ireland. <clears throat> you know, we come from a big flax growing part of the world there. And a lot of girls in my village got involved in the flax industry. Either shackling the flax, you know, putting it in bundles, or thrashing the flax, or combing the flax and getting it ready to be made into linen. But I wasn't interested in that life at all. I know, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, why didn't I just get married? Well, you know, there weren't really that many available men in my village of Bally Bay. My sisters, Eliza, Matilda, they married the Rutledge brothers. They were shoemakers. It was a very 
safe, secure life. But I thought it was rather dull. That wasn't for me. So, even though, as you can see from my photo at the time, I was a very pretty girl, and I could have married, I chose not to. I decided in 1863, at the age of 17 or 21, depending on whose math you are using, to emigrate to America. I got on a ship by myself, mind you, and I sailed first to New York and then on to San Francisco, which means I had to go all the way around the Cape of South America because at the time, it was really very, very dangerous to go across that isthmus of Panama, as you probably know. I'm actually reading your minds, and I, I think you're saying, how could this young girl from Bally Bay, Ireland afford to take a ship that far, all the way from Great Britain to San Francisco? There are those who suggest that perhaps I was an indentured servant and that someone was paying my passage and that I had to work that off. There is no documentation to prove that at all. None whatsoever. Another theory. Some say that because William's best friend, Harry Haslam, with whom he spent a lot of time in England and then also in America, that when Harry Haslam married a girl named Margaret Potts, she was Irish too. Maybe she was my relative, they say. Maybe my sister. They suggest that perhaps they wrote to William and asked him to come to San Francisco just to meet me. Or that they brought me from Ireland to San Francisco to meet him. No proof of that theory either. I mean, a girl can't reveal every single detail about her life, can she? Or she'd, she'd have no mystery. But we did marry. We married in 1867. In my wedding ring, it says, To my wife, February 1867. You know, William was very ready to get married. He'd written to his parents many times in England that the West had wonderful opportunities, but it had to be the hardest place on earth to find a wife. And then he found me. And I was a very suitable bride. I, I was considerably younger. But, you know, I hadn't been working in a saloon or worse places. So I was appropriate as a wife for William Kirkman. He was actually a pretty wealthy man already. He'd been working in the Idaho gold towns, you know, and he'd had butcher shops and herds of cattle. That was his career. So he already had a pretty tidy fortune. After we married, you know, I guess we could have stayed in San Francisco. I probably would have liked that. But that's not where his career was. It was back in Idaho, so we had to go back there. And you're probably wondering how we got there. One had to get on a ship in San Francisco and then sail to Portland and then get to the Columbia, which was no small feat, and then to get on a steamship. And do you know that they were charging $25? However, they could get away with it because it was during the gold rush. One got on a steamship and then went all the way till you reached the falls, you know, the falls, the huge falls on the Columbia. You act as though you don't know what I'm talking about. The big falls on the Columbia, there's no way you could take a boat over those. So you had to stop at the falls and get on a ladder and climb up the bank and then go across past the falls, get on another ship and then finally sail to Wallula. Well, in those days, in Wallula, it's not like you could just get on the train and go to Walla Walla, not like now, because Dorsey Baker had not built his railroad yet, not till 1875, so you had to go by coach. We arrived in Walla Walla. This is a very early engraving, 1865. 
Yes, it was kind of a rough town, but you know it had a lot of amenities, even a bookstore. And lots of shopping. Well, it needed to have a place for lots of provisions because all the miners passed through Walla Walla on their way to the, wall, to the gold fields in Idaho. I'm pretty sure we stayed at the city hotel. <sighs> the city hotel had just burned down in 1865. Then they rebuilt it. We stayed there. And then in 1887, they had another fire, and it burned to the ground again. <laughs> then onto a stagecoach and off to Idaho. We lived in two towns there, Placerville and Idaho City, both very important in terms of gold mining. You know, and I had not been a princess. I'd never been pampered. So I fit right in with that, that lifestyle, as you can see. I learned to ride a horse. I didn't want to stay in the cabin all day. So I would go out with William and I'd visit the herds and I'd prop the baby on the saddle. It was a good life. We'd been there just a couple of years, and then in 1869, we had a terrible winter, and a lot of our cattle died, and then our little baby George died. <sighs> William wrote to his parents that it was an affectation of the brain. He suffered horribly. And I was, of course, heartbroken. I didn't know at the time, of course, how many other children I would lose, but as I said, more about that later. We were very demoralized by that experience, and we decided to return to Walla Walla. We knew it well, William especially well. It was a good place probably to raise children. It was still very rough. Uh, there were the saloons, the hangings, the vigilantes. Uh, the brothels, also called hurdy-gurdy houses at the time, but a good place to raise cattle, a good place to raise children, and we moved there. Our first house was very modest. Well, you know, at the time, all the houses in Walla Walla were very modest. This is our house. It, it was on Colville. It's since been torn down. We moved in, uh, to Walla Walla in 1871. We had more children. We had um, little Agnes, and Fanny, and Robert, and Grace. And you're kind of wondering, I suppose, how we could move from this house to the very grand one just nine years later on Colville and Cherry. Well, I'll tell you how. First of all, William formed a partnership with John Dooley. You've probably heard of him. Very important cattleman in Walla Walla. He was Irish, just as I was. And then, of course, they got involved in dryland wheat farming, which really took off in 1864. Very important industry, especially as the gold in Idaho was starting to peter out. So it was great timing for Walla Walla. Mr. Dooley and my William had a meat market right downtown, the Pioneer Meat Market, as an outlet for all their beef and their mutton and their pork. They even had venison there and sometimes bear meat. It was right down the street from the Baker Boyer Bank. Maybe you don't recognize this Baker Boyer Bank because they've since built another one that's bigger and grander. And who knows, maybe in a few years they might even build one that's even larger with like columns. I don't know. It's possible. Finally, 1880, and we moved into our very grand home on the corner of Colville and Cherry. It was made of western brick, had a mahogany staircase imported marble surrounds and all the fireplaces, an inlaid hardwood floor in the entryway. We even hired a craftsperson to come in and to do a faux marble treatment in the vestibule, upstairs and downstairs. It was very elegant. We were very prosperous, but I have to say that wealth cannot buy you happiness, nor health for, for your children, nor keep you from heartache. 
You remember little Agnes? She died three years old in 1873. And then we lost little Robert in 1878 and Grace in 1879. Scarlet fever for both Robert and for Grace. Although diphtheria was very prevalent at the time too and even smallpox. You know, Dorsey Baker, Dr. Dorsey Baker, he lost four of his children to diphtheria. But my William Henry and my Fanny were thriving, and then I had Myrtle and Leslie. They both survived infancy, but then in 1878, I lost another baby, Daisy, and in 1882, little Mabel. She only lived two days. You'd think I was probably the most melancholy and unhappy of people, but I coped. One thing I did was very common amongst women at the time. I wove a wreath. Perhaps you know what this wreath is made of. That's right, human hair. Sometimes women would weave the wreath of hair simply from deceased people. Like the last gesture would be to remove a lock of hair from someone you'd lost. But my wreath was made both of the hair of children I had lost and from my living children, all woven together in this wreath, which is now framed and hangs in my bedroom. I also made a lot of trips to the cemetery because that's where all my little ones were. And of course now William is there too. Before William died, we even went back to Idaho and we retrieved little George's coffin from the cemetery there and we brought it back on the train. But I had four surviving children. Let me introduce them. William Henry and Fanny and Myrtle and Leslie. And you know, we had many happy times. William was elected, actually appointed to the city council, but he was elected to the school board, hands down. And also he was on the board of trustees for Whitman College and the first board of the penitentiary. It was very important in the community. The children went just a block away to Baker School for elementary, but for high school, we thought they needed a more challenging education, so we sent them to Whitman Academy, which was connected to Whitman College, a high school of the time, very rigorous curriculum. There were other happy times, too. You remember when Rutherford B. Hayes came to town, 1880? She remembers. Um, I wore my blue dress to the reception. Of course, we were invited. There was a fancy dinner at the Stein Hotel. We had oysters and salmon, and the menu was all printed in French. It was very elegant. You know, I've kept this dress. I've preserved it. I'm going to hand it down to Fanny, and I'm hoping that perhaps she will take really good care of it and hand it down to her descendants so that they may all enjoy it in the future. I'm just sure she will. And there were other fun events in our life. Remember in 1882, it was in the newspaper, you must have read about it, that William threw a surprise party for me at our home for my birthday. And everybody who was anybody came that day. And you know, we had um, tennis on the lawn. <coughs> at Kirkman House. We had sleigh rides in the winter because we had our own horses and our own sleigh. In the summer, we had picnics. This one is in a grove right outside town. We're in the third row. You might have a little trouble picking us out. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have possibly been the successful social hostess that I was without my faithful servant, Ah Sing, a Chinese gentleman. This is not Ah Sing. We need to have his photograph taken, and I'm not sure why we have not done so. This is actually 
Wooey, who works for Mrs. Baumeister. But she is just one of many prominent wealthy people in Walla Walla who has a Chinese man as a domestic. Ah Sing is very faithful. He is a pretty good cook. He does a wonderful job of laundry because, you know, there's all that washing and bleaching and ironing of all those ruffles and pleats. He has um, a bit of a mischievous streak. Like at, um, on April Fool's Day, he, he bakes cotton balls into the biscuits. And if Leslie and Myrtle don't behave, he puts pickle juice in their ice cream. He also has a propensity to gamble. And sometimes of a night after work, he will go down to Chinatown, it's not that far from our home, and he will play cards. In the morning, if he has not won, we can tell that. The clanging of pots and pans and the breaking of dishes lets us know that the night before he was not successful. But he's been a very good, good servant. Someday I would assume that he will go back to China. He will have earned enough money to go back and stay with his family. He cannot own property in Walla Walla. He cannot own a business. We do not treat our Chinese population well at all. And when he does go back to stay, I won't begrudge him and I will wish him well. In 1892, we had still another honor. William was chosen as the representative, the delegate, to the Republican National Convention in Minneapolis. You will remember that year that Harrison was uh, running against Cleveland. Do you recall that? And um, he was chosen as a delegate. So he said, you know, I have a great idea. Let's go to Minneapolis, and then we will keep going on the train to the East Coast, where we will get the city of Paris, a very magnificent ship very lavish. And we will sail to England and Ireland and see our families. And we'll also go over to France because Fanny is going to get married soon and we will buy her wedding clothes. We did so. And we stopped in Boston and we got our William Henry who was in law school there. And we all sailed to Europe. Well, of course we left Myrtle and Leslie because they were just little children. But remember, Ah Sing was at home to take care of them. We had an absolutely wonderful trip. We were gone for many months. We went to, to England, as I said, and we went to Ireland, and we saw my sister Matilda, but not my sister Eliza. She had emigrated to America in 1889. Why? Well, she left her husband, Thomas, the shoemaker, you remember? That scoundrel, he fathered a child with still another of our sisters. She, of course, was rather an outcast, as was her little girl, although the Rutledges were pretty kind to her. And later, that little illegitimate niece of mine, she married a very nice man, and they immigrated to California, and she had a very happy life. But I was glad that Eliza left Thomas. On her ship's passage, she said she was a widow. I'm glad she left that scoundrel. On the way home, it had been a wonderful visit. We were on the train, William, I, Fanny, William, Henry, and William died. He died in Wisconsin on the train. Fanny was in the same sleeping car as he. Her birth was across from his, and all of a sudden she saw his hand fall lifeless from behind the curtain, and she knew he had died. So when he came home, it was in a coffin. But they had the funeral in the parlor at our home, and there were so many mourners that they filled the streets, the yard, and the house, and they flew the flag at half-mast at City Hall. Which means that I had a lot of years to be a widow. I was heartbroken, of course, but I was also very grateful that I was not one of those women like poor Mrs. Thomas here who had to turn her house into a boarding house 
just to be able to keep her home. I mean, the very idea of strangers living in my home just makes me cringe. I cannot imagine. No, I was, I was very well provided for. We had the farms, we had the ranches. And you know, it's interesting. Unless you are on your own, you never get mentioned in the city directory. So until 1893, it was as though I didn't exist. But after William died, I got listed. Isabella Kirkman, parentheses, widow William. What it should have said is, Isabella Kirkman, head of Kirkman Incorporated. Because who kept those ranches and those farms going? I did, with the help of my children. And then later we had our clothing store, the Togs, you probably shopped there, and the Model Boot Company. And we're thinking about starting a confectionery called the Mistletoe, right downtown on Main Street. We're still working on that. And of course, you know, we had our social activities still. I didn't stop that just because William had died. You know, when the Penroses came to town after their wedding, their house was not ready. So Stephen Penrose and his bride, they stayed at Kirkman House until their home was finished. Also, you know, I belonged to lots of clubs. As I said before, the Reading Club and the Symphony Club. And Fanny and I both belong to the Women's Park Club. You've probably heard of it. John Langdon, local businessman, basically a very creative person, he drew this plan for a city park. Walla Walla really needs a city park. We do not have one. And his idea was to finance this park, that the Women's Park Club, to which I belong, should sell buttons. So he took his design for the park, and he had it printed on these buttons. It's not a coincidence that these buttons are the same size as a silver dollar. Guess how much they cost? That's right, a dollar. I sell them to gentlemen. They have a pin on the back. They pin them to their lapel and it is a fundraiser for our park. Do you, do you have your button yet? Because if you do not, I can sell you one. I have some right here. You're probably wondering what happened to my children. Well, William Henry, after he finished law school, he came back to Walla Walla very helpful to me in business. I'm just positive that he will follow in his father's footsteps in the city council. I can, I can just see it. He married finally at the age of 30. He married a girl named Maud Ashley. She's a nice enough sort of girl, although I'm not sure she's really out of the top drawer, if you know what I mean. She uh, listed her occupation on a 1900 census report as waitress, a waitress for the son of William and Isabella Kirkman. Fanny, Fanny is my shining star. She married Alan Reynolds, very important local boy. You know, for her eighth birthday, she received a piano all the way from New York, and she was a music major at Whitman College, but she was an excellent writer. And when a very young girl she wrote this treatise, which was published in the newspaper, called The Duties and Privileges of Capitalism. It's, it's lengthy, but very interesting. And, and I have a copy here, if you would care to read it. I'll save it for later. Fanny was, of course, involved in all her clubs. She was very active in the art club and would often present. And like I said, we were both in the Women's Park Club. Do you have your button yet? Myrtle, Myrtle, Myrtle. I'm kind of worried about Myrtle. She, um, she's always been very reserved, very shy. When she was at Whitman Academy, she was involved in some clubs, like the Glee Club, and she's on some committees at the Congregational Church. We're all Congregational Church members. But she seems very melancholy and very withdrawn, and I'm 
doubt that she will ever marry. It's possible she may stay with me her whole life. Leslie, my youngest. You know, when you've lost a lot of children, your youngest is likely to be spoiled. I think that's probably the case with our Leslie. His favorite thing to do as a little boy was to go out to the Indian encampments outside of town and buy watermelon and corn. And one day he came home with a pony. A pony. He had bought a pony from the Indians. We let him keep it. You know, we Kirkmans have had a good life. We've had a lot of financial and social success. But I think we should never forget from where we've come. And I think we should be very grateful for all that we have. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? I could be either Isabella Kirkman or I could be the person who is outside of Isabella Kirkman in a different oh, era. I'm showing you Isabella. Okay, I I'll be Isabella. Be, I hope you won't disappear. Nope, I'm, I'm here to stay. <laughs> well, I was sorry to hear you lost so many uh, of your children at such uh, early ages. Thank you. Yes, was this all because of different diseases? You know, we, we don't always know because, of course, at the time, I don't think doctors were very successful at identifying them. Um, we did have Dr. Mousy. I know uh, he signed the death certificate for Grace, and he said scarlet fever. And then the death certificate for little Robert was also scarlet fever, which was very common at the time. Little George in Idaho, because he had such a high fever, I don't know. It could be that it's something today people might call meningitis. Could be. And the two little babies, I don't think it was very uncommon for little babies not to last very long. So that pretty much sums it up. Agnes is, is a mystery. We don't know what happened to little Agnes at three. Well, your, your cheerfulness in spite of all these deaths Thank is you. certainly a credit to you. Thank you very much. And you said you, you are a Protestant. Oh, but most certainly. And so, uh, and a Congregationalist, is that right? That is correct, although in Ireland I was, um, I belonged to what, what was equivalent to the Church of England, except it was the Church of Ireland. <clears throat> I see. I see. So did, you were able to find some comfort in the teachings of religion and with the death of the children? I think that really helped me a lot. When I joined the Congregational Church, it was after uh, P.B. Chamberlain had re retired, and I think that that was probably helpful too. I think that the minister who followed him up was probably a little more in keeping with my feelings and attitudes. Uh -huh. yeah. What was your attitude toward the Reverend Chamberlain? Uh, I, I had heard um, stories that he was not perhaps as progressive as I in terms of uh, the education of young women. Uh -huh. That that sounds like mm -hmm. what I would think too. Anything else? Sorry, Reverend Chamberlain. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? My Kirkman friends might have other questions. Okay, good. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed myself very much. Well, so did we. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.